previously, previously on the Game On Podcast. So I came over, uh, had one training session, absolutely loved it. Um, and the boys were, were wonderful. I went back to Melbourne. Um, and I was supposed to go on a camp with Sandringham. And I rang Andy Collins and said, look, Colo, um, I'm going to go to Adelaide. He wasn't too happy. Um, and then, obviously, a few years later, he, he lobbed up coaching Westies. But, um, yeah, I moved over, probably expecting to be here for maybe six months, see how it went. And, yeah, mate, it's just a tick over 26 years now. I was going to so, say you're still here. Now, I would have been shot. I'd, forgot, I'd <laughs> forgotten to do this, uh, Pete. There is, there is one moment when Robbie was playing for Sydney. And he looks up and he sees a banner, Bob Neal, with NEIL on it. And he thinks, oh, that's nice that, you know, I've got some support here and all that. But they could at least spell my bloody name correctly. And I admit I was ringing Danny Hanson. That's what yes. I was talking to on the phone when I walked in, yes. trying to remember if there was any others there. And uh, he told me exactly where it was. And it was just a plain Bob Neal. And so he walks up to Scotty Robinson and Scotty Robinson goes, hey, pow. Nothing to do with you, you mate. It's to do with the Adelaide Footy Club. He's a le- he he is a legend. Not not you, pal. So yeah. <laughs> well, the Ouch. other the other funny part about that, Mel, is that I mentioned Troy Gray. Troy worked at Sydney Uni, um, and he was doing a bit of bar work there. And yes. the guy who managed the bar went to Adelaide Uni, and he had the Bob Neal songbook. Yes. So, no, and I, then I, I gave you one. There's a Bob Neal stand. I'm going, mate. Yeah. I swear, mate. I've got a fan club up on the eastern side, just in front of the. The, um, the Bill O'Reilly the wrong, man, yeah, mate. yeah. And he goes, nah. He said, mate, they're, they're from Adelaide Uni. I'll show you. And he's brought out the Bob Neal songbook and had it. So um, I know you gave me a copy. Yeah, um, when you when first I started at Nord, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I already had one, mate. I had one yeah. in 1994. So <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the first copies, I reckon. But, um, yeah, that's how we got it. But Robbo, um, yeah, he, had, he was, he was a, a Nord boy yes. um, previous to that, before going to Sturt when he got back. But... Um, he was a good mate of mine there, but yeah, he um, he knew who Bob Neal was and told us all the Macca stories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I had a good feel for the Norwood Footy Club before I actually moved over here. Sportscast SA presents Game On. Game On. South Australia's destination for everything sports. Local, national, and international sports. AFL football, soccer, basketball, golf, baseball, tennis, cricket, and any other sports played in this wide world. And we're going to have a blast doing it. So sit back, relax, and let's do this thing. Welcome Welcome to to Game On. Welcome to Game On. My name's Pete and Malcolm once again in the studio and Robbie Neal there. Part two with the uh, the banner at the SCG, uh, young fella expecting a lot of uh, support, and it's not for him. <laughs> yeah, it was bloody funny that I do remember talking about him. God, as we said, that's twenty, nearly twenty five years ago. We first had that conversation, yep. and Scotty Robinson uh, putting him back in uh, putting him back in the spot. I admit I forgot to tag Scotty on the post, so I will I will later on, on go that back one. and do that one as yep. well. All right, mate, let's get into around the grounds. Around the grounds. All right, today as usual, we're going to do the SNFL, the SNFLW, some cricket. Our special guest in the SNFL segment uh, this week is David Kuzner from the Woodville West Torrens Footy Club and Craig Martin talking all things golf with Liv being in Adelaide this weekend. But we'll kick off with the AFL. We'll, um, we'll, we might leave the hot topics just to to the side for the moment and we'll start off with the Adelaide Footy Club. Um, the Oval proposal once again seems to look like it's hit another snag. When is enough enough? They're going to have to keep fighting trying to get somewhere. That's the problem. Um, it's really frustrating and as some people have said, and I, and I completely agree personally, Brisbane have got it right. One council and you, how much bullshit do you get rid of? Yeah, It's pathetic. It's embarrassing. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the classic example is Sturt want to put a uh, fence, fence around yeah, their oval stuff. just for security. And yet I was listening to the interview that, you know, the councilman got to jump through this hoop and yeah. that hoop and yeah. they were originally thinking that it was going to be decided on Monday night and oh, then, no you know, it's just yeah. ridiculous the yeah. amount of 
politics that is going on, not only you know, oh, and then at you a have, council level as well. Yeah, and you have the stupidity of the Parklands Preservation Society getting involved where, realistically, this should have been at the Aquatic Centre. That was the no-brainer. They, they actually got offered a... I don't think the deal was great for, for the Adelaide Footy Club. Yep. Uh, they got offered a, a wish out. The Adelaide City Council should have... That was an Ikea start you car moment, and you have the bozos when the parklands get involved, where ironically it was providing more parklands if that actually out of that, but mm. bury your head in the sand bullshit, yeah, very frustrating. We're all for preserving the, the oh. parklands where we possibly can, but yeah. you've got to amalgamate the, the new uh, stadiums and the new equipment and the new uh, clubs within your, your area as well. Um, you know, speaking with someone who's not from Adelaide, asking why do we have so many parklands? Um, clear and obvious reason for that is we want to continue to have a beautiful state, but there has to be some development there as well. Yeah. Uh, we'll stick with Adelaide, mate. The Essendon game, a bit of a debacle in every sense. There was no real silver lining from this game for me. No, nah, nothing whatsoever. Um, I admit, I'm a bit flummoxed for the Adelaide supporters keep carrying on about the umpiring. Well, yeah, but about, there's 50 other yeah, umpiring decisions, decisions a game. It's, it's pathetic. Um, Josh Rochelle. Put your head over the ball twice. Yep. That's way more important than an umpiring so-called error. But but I think that's also, to, to Josh's credit, and I know he's come out and yeah, sort of said, yeah, look, I know you know. That. But I also think that there's a case of they've lost confidence in yes. everything. Oh, no doubt about it. That Which, was probably endemic of the whole 2024 season for the Crows. Yeah, and you would have thought after the game against Carlton, which they'd played well in, um, you would have thought there would have been a bit more impetus than the next week and all that, but it didn't seem like it. Well, a, it was almost a case of they thought that it was just going to happen. Yeah, I'm not sure. Again, I think it's, yeah, shows how much played above the ears, as we always say, mm-hmm. and, yeah, lack of confidence and then errors, shocking disposal. And yeah, Essendon should have won easy. Yes. Um, but, yeah, the carry-on, I'm sorry. Unbelievable over one umpiring decision. Right. Well, we'll talk about that one umpiring decision right now. Where do you sit on it being a, fo- a, a, a an umpire, previous yeah. umpire or an umpire? Yeah. Oh, look, it's holding, holding the ball. Holding the ball? Yep. It is holding the ball. Uh, Lee Matthews to say that... It was pushing the, the back. Pushing or? the back. I'm all for pushing the backs being paid. I, I get really angry that pushing the back Has is a rule which has yeah, now been forgotten. But Taylor Walker didn't push him in the back. If you actually watch that again, he's on, gone on the side. So, mm-hmm. yeah, no, nah, Lee was Lee's wrong there. Um, yeah, he should have been holding the ball, but so what? I'm sorry. Look after the game yourself. Well, I don't think and again, Walker Adelaide, really jumped on him any more forceful than I've seen nah, a million tackles, nah, tackles every weekend. No, nah, if, nah, if, you, if you say that is, you're paying 100 in the back. So, yep. I, yeah, no, I, I thought that was bizarre. And Draper knew at the end afterwards he should have been pinged by his reaction. Um, yeah, it's a poor decision, but yep. get on with it. Now, my next question, and this is probably in my hot topics, but yep. we'll talk about it now yep. while we're here. Can you have the umpires when we're saying they should be brave to make that decision at that time of the game? Now, for me, really? The umpires should be making the decision on... All right, he may not have been sighted or there was legs yeah. involved. Look, I totally understand that, and I, and I understand that from that point of view. But to come out and say, oh, they'd be brave to make that decision at that stage of the game in that area of the ground, I, I think's un- wrong. Yeah, I do. As an umpire, I understand what he means. Yep. It's probably not the best way of uh, wording. But as an umpire, you really want the players to decide the result. You don't really want to pay yes. a free kick to decide the game. That's that's what he's really trying to say, but it's poor. It should have been paid. Yes. It's an umpiring error. It should have been paid. But get on with it. Why is it then, and this is a question without notice, yep. why is it then during finals we seem to have the umpires almost put the whistles away to a certain degree? Or the grand final. Not Correct. so much the others. Yeah. Because, and I've, got, I've always had this yes. as, as an umpire theory. Yep. You're observed every other week, and your appointments depend on what your observers say. And I've just got that as we're <laughs> yes. talking previously. Yeah, previously, there. yeah, yep. Um, and out of that, once you've got the grand final, you can't do anything else. Yes. So I reckon a lot of umpires go, I reckon there's it's a, a free bit of, hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost a free hit. Yeah. I've Very interesting. I've that theory. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. We'll, Talk about Adelaide and uh, their round this week in a minute. We'll yep. move on to Port Adelaide. Uh, Port Adelaide faced one of their harshest reality checks this season following the thumping to Collingwood at the MCG on Saturday. Yeah, admittedly, I've only seen the highlights. And, look, you're just following the scores. I was up at uh, 
at Modbury and get out of the Modbury folk that I was sitting under the balcony with my dad. Now, Modbury Footy Club, fa- absolutely fantastic to my father because uh, my father lives in the old, uh, in the retirement home yep. across the road. Yep. Well, let's just say a couple of the Modbury people weren't really happy that someone barracking for the other team in Adelaide Uni were <laughs> underneath the thing. So it was entertaining and yeah, yeah. Uni got up. So out of that, Footy clubs but, are good for banter, mate. Yeah. That's what it's He's, all and about. And as one, one guy from Modbury actually did put him back in the place, said, hey, hang on. This is a bit of fun. Yes. Stop. Don't be an idiot. Yeah. And yeah. So it was a bit of fun. So, but um, thank you to Mobbury that what they do for my dad, which is way more important. But so we're checking the scores of that game and shit, pulled a six up. Yes. And all of a sudden we checked the half time score <laughs> and things calling turned it, around. Calling it a goal up. Six five to nothing from the, I think it was the 12 minute mark of the second quarter. And it just continued from there. Mm-hmm. Probably the one. Butters best on ground by a mile at quarter time. Yes. And they managed to put the clamps on Butters and the rest of the team set seemed to fell away a bit there. Horn Francis hurting his hammy as, as well. So it seems to be possible if you block the dynamic three. Yes. Does that then cause a few others can't get footy in and the domino effect. effect. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's certainly it's raised a big question now about Port because at that stage you thought, Geez, they go they're on win here. here. Yep. You're almost thinking, right, they're going to get a top four finish, a couple of home finals. Suddenly the questions are back. Well, back. Un- so. Unfortunately, with most teams this year, you can't put yeah. the crystal ball on yeah, it because exactly. it's just changing from week yeah. to week. Well, that game, it was really 15 minutes changed everything. Yep. So, yeah. All right, we'll uh, we'll leave Adelaide and Port there for last week's games. We'll- Probably the one other point there I'll say from watching, the, just again the highlights, geez. Collingwood did play some bloody yeah, good, good football. You know. yep. Yeah, we'll we'll come to that in a minute because uh, I have got that down here. Um, we'll move on to the AFL hot topics. We'll start off with Adelaide at the moment. Uh, who do they bring in? Dowling, Curtin, Himmelberg, Strawn, or Crouch, or all of them? <laughs> uh, Dowling should have been in from round one for mine. Yep. I, I saw enough of him in his draft year. He's clean. Uh, I, I just can't work out why they haven't played him. Mm-hmm. I think Crouch. Crouch comes in, and I think personally, I drop Riley O'Brien. I, I, I readily admit that. I've seen a stat today trying to say he's high up in the hitouts to advantage. I've got a real beef on the way stats are done. Now, if I'm rucking and the ruck drops at your feet, you grab the ball and just quickly boot it forward. That's yes. called as a ruck hitout to advantage. It's bullshit. No, you should be trying. A ruck hitout to advantage should be a clear in the area, a tap mm-hmm. to advantage, and you actually get a chance to use advantage, not a hack kick forward. So yep. I disagree with the way the stats are done there. Well, um, I mean, you look at someone like a Grundy, a Gorn yeah. uh, in the AFL, Gorn you look especially. at someone like Boyd in the SNFL yes. dominating, uh, giving his. Re- I watched his, Redden on Sunday. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, giving his uh, midfielders first opportunity yep. not only to to get the ball out of the middle but a clean take out yep. of the middle, and that's, that's where you really want to be. Yep. Uh, from all the reports, Strawn obviously is doing well at the SNFL level and still continues to to be shunned. And I just don't know why he's not being talked about enough. I do agree with Crouch. Dowling for me looks like a goer. I oh, use and Curtin. I think every other draftee's been looked at. Yeah, why are we holding him back? Well, especially what they gave up to get him. They made a heaven, heaven and earth play yes. to get him. Yep. So they they missed out on Taylor Goad because of that. Yep. I can't. I understand round one or two, but I would have thought by now you go right. Let's have a look. Absolutely. Especially when they're struggling. Well, yeah, it doesn't get much. No, I don't get it. Much worse than this. Um, what do we make of the Rochelle celebrations and the miss marks? We did talk about it briefly before. Is it a case of you know, young player down on confidence. I think the real worrying bit now. I every side will be targeting him physically from now on. So there's a real question mark on the kid. Massive question well, mark. And he and hasn't just got the old line. He hasn't just got the the gorilla on his back. He's got the whole bloody zoo on his back yep. at the moment. Uh, it'll really show what the team is made of, whether they stick up for him or not, or just yeah. let let it go because. Yeah. I think that's the one thing that the Crows have missed for quite some time is a bit of mongrel. Yep. Um, Funny you mentioned that in terms of mongrel. I actually watched uh, my son out on one of his sales, found the 1988 Bicentennial Carnival game. And obviously I, I was there, yep. but just watched it again last night. It's the first time I've seen it again since. And how much 
Marty Leslie intimidated Dermot Brereton and Gary McIntosh intimidated Diesel Williams. Mm-hmm. It was extraordinary. And I messaged Marty Leslie, previous guest yes. on the show, yes. uh, about that. So it was actually interesting and and Aishi, and Aishi agreed. And that, so it was really interesting to see South Australia mm-hmm. intimidating intimidated Victoria. Victoria. So it was good. Uh, maybe that's something that the Crows need to work on. Is yeah. a little bit of mongrel, just somewhere from someone. Yeah, I agree. I'm not saying go out there stupid and no, no, no. go nuts, but you know you can't play uh, almost touch footy these days. Uh, but you do need to have a little bit of mongrel. And you look at some of the better teams at the moment; they do have one or two enforcers in there. All right, let's uh, stay with Adelaide there. I know the name of the game is to win, but are the Crows better off trying to cycle through the players to see whether they're at the level or are they tradable? I think they have to before the end. Surely, what is the point Strawn's been on the list four years now? Surely they've got to have a look at him with O'Brien struggling. Yep. Um, yeah, I just don't get it so out of that. You know, I mean, but, I know uh, we're only six, seven games in. We're at the quarter mark of the season. I know you don't want to give up, but I know no. the name of the game is wins and losses. But if we're in this rebuild that the Crows are still and I think on. It looks like the rebuild's gone backwards. Yes. So they do. I think they've got to have a decent look at their whole list. Yep. Yep. Ideally. Um, who do they build the team around? Who are the non-negotiables at this stage? Saligo. Yep. Saligo. <laughs> oh, Rankin. Michael Anney. Yeah, Michael Anney. This is not much, though. Rankin. Yeah. Rochelle. Maybe. Thilthorpe. Yeah, I still think so. But, geez. What about Fogarty? No. Fogarty at the moment, there's cool. massive question marks on him. What about in the middle? Dawson, obviously. Yeah. but Gets a bit thin after that. What does. about in the back line? Dawson and Saligo after that. I think Murray. Murray, yep. You've got to remember him being out injured is pretty crucial. Murray, Michael Annie. <sighs> Butts. I think he's a maybe. I think Keane's probably more a tick than Butts. Yep. Hey, and pretty, that's a bit of a worry considering not only is an international player, but two, he's only in what, fifth or sixth year of playing AFL football? It's pretty thin if you really If look you really it drill out. down to it. Yep, that's why I'm yep. saying. Who oh, are the, exactly. Who, you know, when you're starting a new team, who are you building your spine around? Oh, and and as, this is where I'm at. Oh, so many honest battlers. How can you have Riley O'Brien and Lockie Murphy in your leadership group? You oh. can't have honest battlers. Battlers. Well, I saw something about Dude, them I trying to rush him back this week or oh, next week. God. Like, please no. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, and the last one there. How many players are playing out of position? Uh, is this part of them being more flexible moving forward? Or, you know, because I look at someone like a Shoal who has got pace, but they won't play him on the wing. Oh, he has played on the wing as well. Yeah. Not so sure it's anyone. I don't think there's anything glaring in that way. I just mm-hmm. think. Just don't think they're good enough. Yep. Can Adelaide mark enough balls inside fifty to outscore their opposition? Not only against North Melbourne this weekend, but any opposition moving forward. At the moment, it's a no, isn't it? It is indeed. All right, let's move on to Port Adelaide with the hot topics. Just a s- surprise stat that the Fab Three or Four haven't spent a whole lot of time in the centre. Approximately twenty percent of game time so far. Yeah, they're probably still trying. Depends how Drew then is involved, whether they've got yep. him tagging, whether they, you know, how do you fit Ollie Wines midfield? They tried to play Ollie Wines somewhere else last year and he showed that he's an in inside midfielder mm-hmm. or an inside midfielder or he doesn't play. Yep. Um, so I but think they played him on a wing, the, though. Yeah, which he's not. I don't think he's not a wing. No. Though. I do not. see him as more of a half forward, though. No, I think he's an inside mid. I just don't think he's quick enough. Anywhere else, I, and I think that's his strength of the bullocking sort of body. Mm-hmm. I just don't think he's got the finesse to play anywhere else. Yep. Boasting a strong midfield consisting of Rosie, Butters, and Horn Francis, the trio were comprehensively beaten at the coalface against the Pies, losing the count by 41. This seems yeah. to be their Achilles yeah. heel, their contested ball. Yeah, we know how good that throw, those that's three what I'm are saying, on the yeah. outside, but. Are they the right mix? Is there enough tough inside balls? I think they're gonna. That's going to be the big question mark on mm-hmm. them, especially playing away. Yep. Uh, this week, uh, Jones, Bergman, and possible hamstring to Horn Francis may stop them from playing this weekend. Yeah, is that going to be a big loss? For I know Horn Francis probably will be. Yeah, but Jones and Bergman. 
Well, it's two more that won't play against Nord on Saturday night. Well, so, yeah, I don't, I don't mind that, that personally. <laughs> forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, no, no, I had. Yeah. No, fair call. And uh, Port Adelaide's coach, Ken Hinckley, stated that there's no end date to his tenure at Alvin following further dialogue surrounding the potential coaching succession plan at the Power. How do we see that one playing out? I hope it doesn't become a Mick Malthouse where he got dragged out screaming. Um, yeah, I don't think that would be in Ken's best interest. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, probably depends what else is happening elsewhere. Wait and see. Well, Wait I mean, there's a long time to go in this season. Yeah, yeah, that's got to play see, out. Yeah. But it seems like a gentleman's handshake has been made with Josh yeah. Carr. So yeah. we'll leave it there. Um, can Port Adelaide change their contested possession game to combat the other top eight or top four sides before the end of the season? Because considering it is their Achilles heel. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Boat comes back involved as well. Yep. Uh, into the equation. So I think it's tinkering. It's a fine line. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I'm... I haven't got poured out of the equation yet. All right, let's continue on with some of the other hot topics going around the AFL. One more on the Crows. The Crows, Crows vow to go hard at the recruiting and trade table. Who, how and why can this happen, considering it's never been their strength? Yeah, yes and no. They have got Dawson and Rankin the last, the last few years, mm-hmm. so out of that. But at the moment, all of a sudden... They're probably nowhere near as attractive as they were at the end of last season where people thought Adelaide were building. Yep. Now all of a sudden, is this the the year where you go backwards before another forward moves? Who who not a hundred percent sure, but which has happened to yeah, a lot of teams. A lot of teams. Carlton are probably the greatest example well, that Rich, I know of. Richmond did. And Richmond are the same. Yeah, so it's not a it's not a yes or a no, but I just I just can't find anybody that would fit what they need and how they need it right here, right now, at the moment. I'd like to get Lacocious, but he's not. They need more. You know, well, the guys rucking for Sydney, for mine, was always their greatest requirement. Yep. Um, so... But but also the players... Again, but I, also I, the players got to want to come, too. Oh, That's yeah, the other very thing. much so. This but is the other thing. I don't sort of get... Where Port have recruited Soldo and Sweet this year, well... I would have thought Adelaide would have been made a big play for one of those two as well, mm-hmm. and it doesn't seem like it happened. Well, there's a Ruckman sitting uh, at Fremantle on a pretty big size yeah. of a contract that's not getting a game at the yeah. moment or is getting a game but being played out of position. So yeah. interesting call on that one there. Did the uh, real Collingwood finally turn up last week? You, I think I think we think so, but let's wait and see. I, I, you know, they should beat Essendon on Anzac Day, but yeah. Uh, I'm. S- if you can bash Collingwood into a real hard for scrap game, yes, Collingwood lack of a key forward can can come out. But if they manage to move it quickly enough, and they've got multiple options, oh, model, yeah. So that's the that's the question. Mark. I think that's the same with most teams. Yeah, they get that true. little bit of movement. I mean, Adelaide were exactly like that against Carlton the yeah. week before. So, yeah, very very interesting. Uh, AFL teams resting players this early in the season. Is this a sign that the amount of games or the squad numbers needs to be revised? Yeah, possibly because it's come out. It looks like Harley Reid won't play for West, uh, Coast. West Coast. So yeah, yeah, I agree. For mine, yeah, I'm a bit surprised. Like Charlie Dixon last week. Yeah, you know, well, and this is yeah, probably where it gets to. Uh, I, I do I have this on the run it. sheet. In that teams that are already pre working out their players who were having a rest in round six. And yeah. like Port came out and said, well, we made this decision at the beginning yeah, of the year, which I, is really weird for me. Yeah, so, yeah I, I think that's a bit too much forward planning, cut in stone and a bit of lack of, yeah, let's work this out a bit. I'll, you know, I would have thought he could have played last weekend, Charlie Dixon, and mm-hmm. not played this week. Yep. So, yeah. Port looked totally different without Dixon there as well. Yeah. Which is um, very interesting. Although they started like a bomb, so, yep. yeah. Uh, the AFL fixture has come under scrutiny from club captains with a dispute over the amount of short turnaround between games. What are your thoughts on that, mate? It's everyone. I think they've all got... I think there was a, a deal down there where they'd virtually all... Every club's got a, got the same number of short breaks. So, yep. it's one of those things. And I'm sorry, it's not like now you're rushing... You're getting home and rushing to your, your full-time job and then rushing to training and... 
they don't have to do anything else. They can have you know massage, massage the physios, physios ice down baths, the beach, yep. yeah, ice bath. So I, I think that's it's a bit over the top. Is it a case of that if your squad is deep enough, you're able to cover those short turnarounds in a smart way? Not, I'm, I'm, I know we're sort of talking about resting players, yeah. but in this situation where you do have these sort of three games in eleven days or whatever it is that a few few teams have had to play lately. The depth of your squad is being tested right there and then, isn't it? It is, but out of that, so is the opposition. Yes. I, you know, I don't quite, like, there's been a lot of carry on St Kilda-wise. Well, hang on, Western Bulldogs were virtually in the same boat. So, yeah, it's not like one was came, coming off of a seven-day yeah. break and one was only coming off a four-day four break. You came together around, everyone was here. And I, I'm sorry, that that's an interstate. We're acting like Adelaide's so far away. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not travelling to China no. or the US, no. you know, yeah, 12, 14 hour Trip. All right, we'll leave that one there. Yeah. Um, Anzac Day, the, is this the biggest day outside the grand final in the AFL? It is, and I've always said I think it's disgraceful that it's a two-side monopoly. I've always said it should be the previous year's grand finalists. Keep it simple, exactly what is done here. Mm-hmm. Gornell, you know, Nord had the benefit last year. Yep. Game was at the home of football where uh, tomorrow, and I'll probably go down the bay tomorrow afternoon. Um, yep. That's the way it should be for mine. Absolutely. It would be nice to see it shared around, but then again, there's games now around it. We've got uh, Anzac know. Eve and and the and the day of yeah. and the day after and yeah. so on and so on. So, but it is a round. It is an Anzac round. Yep. But I think you're right. The last two years grand finalists would certainly be good. Um, does the AFL draft help struggling teams advance up the ladder, or does it leave them to wane at the bottom? Well, at the moment, suddenly West Coast seemed to have helped and Reed <laughs> suddenly exploded. So yep. I think you can probably have a bit of a case of that both ways. Well, um, I mean, you look at North Melbourne as the opposite example. Yeah. Um, you know, what, won one game out of their last 27. Yeah. Um, you know, Horn Francis obviously left for, for personal reasons as yeah. well. But, you know, how, how long do you keep flogging a de- dead horse? That's the that's the big question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's yeah, it's. I, I don't think there's a yes or a no on that one. Yep. Um, Cam Zerha, uncertain uh, future at North Melbourne, which is what we were talking about yep. there. Who are possible suitors? Let's go back to the previous point. Well, let's not say the drafting. Mm-hmm. Let's go on development, coaching, and all that. Is that good enough? Yep. So it's not just the draft. It, everyone goes, oh, you know, picking McCartan over Petrarca mm-hmm. or. or you know, uh, Billings over Bonapelli are shocking yep. choices. Well, but who's to say that that development coaching wasn't better yes. elsewhere? So I think that's a very important point. I think Sorry. also that no, no. I think a lot of that also plays into the the soft cap and the cap for uh, the coaching group. Obviously, pre COVID, now post COVID, uh, that you really need to get some of that uh, back up to the levels that it was to, for you to be able to employ those coaches. Yeah. Maybe you've put too many eggs in one basket. Yeah. Anyway, yep. is what it is. Um, uh, the AFL draft helping struggling teams, you've sort of said that, mm, well, it can work both ways, yeah. so I totally understand that. How have the Cats got it so right when so many are to get it wrong? Uh, yeah. Smart drafting, recycling players, player development, which we were just talking about. I think it's a bit of, bit of everything, but if you do it, Go through their draft choices of their glorious times where Chapman, Kelly, Johnson were all 30-plus uh, Cam Ling. So mm-hmm. they made some fantastic decisions mm-hmm. on drafting. And you know, that's where Wells was regarded as the guru. So, yeah. Something that uh, a few teams need to look at uh, moving forward. AFL Executive General Manager of Football, Laura Kane, announced the appointment of experienced senior marketing and strategy specialist Emma Moore as the new general manager role of the AFLW. Yeah, let's just wait and see. You know, I'll give anyone the, anyone a chance to start with, with anyone. But as I've said on Laura Kane, the jury's well and truly out there. Uh, still, still... Question mark for me as well. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. Uh, the AFL Tribunal, did they get it wrong with the Toby Green decision? How can you fix it or can it be fixed? I think there's so many things with this where it's virtually what, a few things. So, one, you're trying to tell the player that you can't brace to protect yourself. You've got to leave yourself wide open that the, the player in front's effectively got right away and it's your yep. duty. It goes against everything you've always taught. And his instinct is to turn to brace yourself. Mm-hmm. 
Also, really, what was the difference between what uh, Toby Green did and what Peter Wright did? Because it's outcome based. Yes. He one game versus four games. Yeah, you know, on the AFL rulings, the way it still is at the moment, go through a red light camera, but not cause an accident. Play on. You know, I just I think there are so many things, and again, the Jesse Hogan one last night, where really I, I it's starting to seem like the guy who's running the tribunal is a bit of well up you, you'll do as I say, sort of thing, because a cut, few of his decisions have been. Almost aggressive back going, no, so your wording's wrong. So, yeah, there's a few really... Um, questionable, yes, questionable outcomes from yeah. from the tribunal. I totally agree with you. Frustration. I heard Jonathan Brown come out and say, we're becoming more and more like Gaelic footy. That's oh. a worry for from a f- former player saying that I can see this sort of happening this it way. Is, it is, but, but what's happening behind the scenes concussion-wise... I get why they're doing it, mm-hmm. but I think it's lacking consistency and it's lacking common sense. Yes. Yep. So. All right, mate, we better take a very, very quick break. We'll come back um, and we'll talk our tips for this weekend and um, and then obviously move on to the SNFL, the SNFLW, the cricket, and our special guest, David Kuzner. A dent and scratches putting a dent in your day. Introducing Roger Steen Crash Repairs Adelaide, your trusted solution for automotive woes. With over two decades of expertise, Roger Steen Crash Repairs guarantees top-notch service, restoring your vehicle to its former glory in no time. From minor dings to major collisions, our skilled technicians handle it all with precision and care, using state-of-the-art equipment and techniques. Roger Steen Crash Repairs saved my car. It looks brand new. Fast, friendly and reliable. I wouldn't trust anyone else with my vehicle. Don't let accidents slow you down. Visit Roger Steen Crash Repairs Adelaide at 14 Penner Avenue, Glynn for quality service you can count on. And here's a special offer just for our listeners. Mention this podcast and receive a $100 discount on your repair. Roger Steen Crash Repairs Adelaide. Excellence in every repair. Hi, I'm Rachel Spawn and you're listening to the Game On Podcast. All right, mate, we continue on with the AFL. Uh, Some tips for this week, Richmond v Melbourne. I'll go for the Ds. I'll go the Ds there. The uh, big Thursday Anzac clash between Essendon and Collingwood. Highs. I'm going to go Collingwood as well. The Giants v the Lions. Yeah, I'll, I'll go the Giants if in doubt. It's in Canberra. Too. It is Monica so. Oval there. Uh, I'm going to go the Giants there as well. Uh, Port Adelaide v St Kilda. Port Adelaide. I uh, picking Port Adelaide to bounce back there. North Melbourne v Adelaide. Adelaide. I'm picking North Melbourne. Yeah, I, I, I don't blame. I, that I just at all. think it's one of these games yeah, toss that the coin. that could go horribly wrong for the Crows. And yeah, no, no, I don't want it to happen, but no, I just enough. see North getting up for this game and it's down in Tassie and yeah, Crows don't enough. play well down there. All right. uh, Geelong v Carlton. Toss the coin, I've gone the Cats. I'm going to go the Blues. Yep, yep. But in a close one, a very, yep. very close one. Uh, the Dockers v the Bulldogs. Geez, that's a hard one. <laughs> it really is. The Dockers, you know. They were horrible last yeah, week against West they were Coast. atrocious and... I'm going to go, I think the Western Bulldogs are a better side on paper. I'm going for the Dogs. I'm going to go the Bulldogs as yeah. well. Yeah. But again, just, it's yeah. for me a flip of the coin there as well. Suns v uh, West Coast? I'll go the Suns. I'll go the Suns with Reed obviously yeah. getting a rest, which I think's good. I think they're managing him yeah, well. I understand why. Play him for four or five weeks, then give him a little bit of time off. Uh, I think I did hear, who was it today on the radio? It might have been Timmy G talking about playing... Some of these guys, uh, you know, these younger guys for four or five weeks and then giving them a little spell rather than playing 20 or 30 games in yep. in the second tier. Uh, the Hawks feed the Swans. I'll go the Swans. And for the first time this year, we don't have a bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we get through all nine games this weekend. Uh, let's move on to the SNFL. Uh, round two games uh, were won by Central Districts. North Adelaide getting up over Sturt. Interesting yep. one there. Yep. Uh, Glenelg uh, putting Adelaide to the sword a little bit. Adelaide uh, Norwood getting up over the uh, the Bloods, and Woodville West Torrens continue to impress over Port Adelaide. 
Yeah, they did the job. I did go down on Sunday to have a look at that. So, uh, yeah, for mine, it's funny. We'll talk to David Kusner about the recruit, the recruiting side of it. But ironically, the most important one is probably Jared Redden returning. Mm-hmm. And it, geez, he looks in good nick. Yep. It's, yeah, he's lighter. His footy smart sh- stood out, and I think he's their key key weapon. And Riley yep. Knight returned, and yeah, they they did enough. So absolutely. Speaking of Woodville West Torrens, we welcome Dave Kuzner to the line right now. Hey, David, we're uh, pleased to have on the line David Kuzner, the uh, CEO of Woodville West Torrens. Man, I've got enormous respect for. Has been heavily involved in uh, coaching the South Australian side, inclusive league, also involved with Woodville West Torrens and with wheelchair footy in general. So he sees the whole picture. A man of many hats. Welcome aboard, welcome aboard, David. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, mate. Uh, let's start off with Woodville West Torrens at the moment. Absolutely flying. Your two big recruits, uh, Sammy Jacobs and uh, Redden, uh, holding the club up at the moment. They're do- doing a great job too, Ruckman. Um, yeah, no, really happy with uh, with how the guys are going. They've, they've managed to bond quite well over the pre-season. It's always challenging when you get a new coach coming in of how, how the uh, the dynamics are going to work out. But um, Source is an amazing individual and, uh, we've, yeah, we're extremely lucky that he that he applied for the job and got the job. So um, no, we're very happy with how he's he's got everything running. Bit of ironry that uh, you know spoke to you several times, you and Luke uh, Luke Powell, when you were out and about uh, with your recruiting drives last year and trying to get out of what you were how you were going, and you were replying back very firmly. No, no, we don't give that that out to Nord Nord people. And amusingly, though, with Jared Redden arriving, managing to get him back and. He looks a million dollars. He looks fitter than what he wa- what he's probably ever been. Yeah, I think that's a real credit to Redo. I think um, obviously uh, every club, um, not not just the Eagles, we all struggle with uh, with finding um, big men that can stay intact for for a long period of time. Obviously, it's a genetic thing when they're they're bigger, they're, they're prone to more injuries. But um, Redo was quite a good one. He was a, it was a quick phone call that. Um, Source, Matthew Goldsworthy, our footy operations manager, and, and myself, we always sat down and spoke about it, and we just thought we'd throw it out to Redo, and I think within about five minutes, Redo was on board. He was, uh, I think it's one of those things, he's probably been waiting to come back, um, but he is in extreme, you know, his, his condition's fantastic at the moment. He's uh, got a lawn mowing round, a uh, Mr. Clip lawn mowing round, and uh, yeah, he's probably, I would say, close to 15 kilos lighter. Yeah, that's what I thought. Finished up. Standing next to him last Sunday night, uh, after afterwards, you know, hanging around at Woodville at Woodville last Sunday night, and I've looked and thought, "Geez, he, he's easily the lightest." And I'm sitting there thinking, "I wish he'd done that because he's a mile better player than Riley O'Brien is, and uh, he looks in fantastic condition at the moment." And I'm I'm sure there's the what ifs, but yeah, that body, that bit of the year off with the not having the grind and the bash and crash, and he's he's he looks fantastic and is you know, a huge recruit for you guys. Oh, exactly right. No, I'm pretty biased, but I would say he's probably the, the number one ruck to, uh, the ruckman going around in the competition. And he just, uh, the, the ability that he's got, he's, he's got a, a young family. They've just had a, a new baby. Um, yeah, Reno's just in a really good place. And uh, he, he does bring something extra to the club when he's around. So, no, we were, we were absolutely uh, over the moon when he accepted to come back in. Oh, it'll be fantastic, Jewel, with him and when him and Harry Boyd, because that's certainly the the two best. And yeah, he looks. Uh, and you know, further going on with what's happening at Woodville West Orange, a big bu- uh, build at the moment, mate. Has all that taking shape, etc. Yeah, so we finished the uh, the Barry Jarman grandstand change rooms have all been finished now. So that's uh, that was a one point six million dollar build that we or refurbishment we, we would call it, um, where we've updated the change rooms and given the guys. Uh, and the girls, the ability to to probably operate out of a professional environment. Prior to that, we were, had the old shower pole with the eight shower heads on it, and we were expecting the young ladies and, and the men and all that to be able to operate out of those facilities, which is just unreasonable in today's um, state league sporting environment. So for us, we're, we were really committed to getting that going. We're now onto our second project, which is the Percy Fox Grandstand. So the away change rooms will be uh, transformed into more um, female-friendly, child-safe environments. Um, That'll start just after July, um, so the away team will be treated no different to the to the home team, which I think is uh, most clubs' ambition yeah. these days is to get yeah. everybody on equal footing in that sense. Yeah, I think gone are the days of you know 
had the opposition shed. change in that little doghouse <laughs> and make sure that there were cold showers. And, yeah, I think we've moved right. past those days. Um, yep. So go through. So now you've you started recently, become the CEO, uh, David. How's, how's that uh, transition into, you know, moving from what you were doing work-wise and running your business there into being CEO, mate? Yeah, no, it's been a really good transition. I mean, I've been I was at the club for I've been at the club for, for nine years um, in a board position. So I held the uh, the um, football portfolios, community engagement, government liaison portfolios at the club, and uh, as a as a volunteer director. And um, to be able to have the opportunity to come in as a CEO and actually work full time in footy has been for me it's it's the ultimate job, and I've uh, I've enjoyed it so far. We've been able to have a really good uh, first nine months in the role where we've been able to make some significant changes at the club within the, the aesthetics of it and um, the management. And, you know, there wasn't there wasn't anything broken at the Eagles, which was fantastic. You know, Luke Power did an amazing job and Christine Williams, amazing jobs prior. So I've been able to just come in and build on what's already been there. But um, in a full-time capacity, it's just, yeah, it's the ideal job for me. Oh, and Christine's a, Christine's a fantastic very quiet, very efficient uh, person, you know, always and not afraid to do anything, like run the water and help out and be, you know, in the reserves game and, yeah, very much down to earth and do anything. Uh, you know, a lot of time for Christine and Sue doing and, and that, that they see the uh, yeah, think, whole picture very well. Oh, I think that's right. I think you've got, yeah, you've got your, your Christines, you've got your Emmas from uh, Emma and Connie from down at Tum. West Adelaide, yep. Sue Dewings, people like that, the, the work they got, those guys put in, and, you know, whether you're a CEO, you, you work for, for next on nothing because it is a seven-day-a-week job at a football club, and it's all hours of the day where you're, you're engaged. Um, but, you know, the, the volunteers of your, your Christine Williams, your Emmas, yeah. um, people like that, they're the ones that, you know, when Christine's running water and that, that's done as a volunteer. Yeah, that's exactly. That's done as somebody that's giving their time to the game uh, because getting volunteers these days is getting harder in all codes, um, not just not just this NFL footy, but, yeah, we, we really got to appreciate people like Christine and that that just give their time freely. And, yeah, you know, in that, exactly, Christine, Sue, so yourself, always there at wheelchair footy too. You, you know, you, um, you know, it's something, it's a passion of mine as well, the whole wheelchair footy. Uh, and we, I think we develop a pretty close community amongst those of us who are involved. And, yeah, it's, yep. you see the, I just think we see the whole, you see the whole picture a bit more. That's right. I think uh, gone are the days where we had the uh, the inter-club rivalries where we wouldn't talk to each other or we were, were against yeah. each other. I think most of the clubs are now combined and we uh, we all want to succeed on the field. Um, that's our, our number one motivating factor of why we exist, but it doesn't mean we can't work together on other things such as improving the wheelchair football games, the inclusive leagues. Um, you know, those things are critical for our communities that we operate within. So, um, no, no, I think... You're right. It's the, the environments are very encouraging at the moment. So, as a as a CEO of a of a you know football club that's in the SNFL, what what are some of the biggest challenges that you've identified, uh, not only from a club point of view but from the SNFL point of view? Yeah, I think um, obviously the uh, for for us it's really it is the volunteer base trying to get the volunteers um, regularly um, because you know we do tend to to use them as much as we can and it does present time issues, timing issues for a lot of volunteers, but um, probably the, the uh, with, with, we've obviously got the uh, the dramas with um, AFL clubs wanting to leave and things like that, which creates some issues at the moment. They just create an instability within the league. I mean, we have got the best um, second leg outside, well, the best leg outside exactly. of the AFL. Um, ask the players. We In our recruiting each year, and we speak to, to many of players from around Australia, they want to come to the SANFL, so we have a we have a brand in the league that is um, second to none, and for us, it's just really maintaining the integrity of the brand, um, which is you know we've we've got very eight strong very cl- uh, eight strong clubs that uh, you know football's played at a high level in South Australia, and I think we should be really proud of that and just keep promoting that. But that that is a challenge for us. Yeah, and you know my thoughts there, David. Um, in terms of to just explain. The inclusive inclusive league. Your environment. Uh, explain the inclusive league to people out there who, who don't uh, you know, need yeah. a bit of information yeah, and your APM. role, mate. Right. So the SNFL APM inclusive league is based on uh, predominantly it's all male athletes at the moment. So it's uh, male athletes with an intellectual disability uh, on a different on a scale. It's it's based on a, a scoring system. 
um, for the, the depth of the disability they have. But from there, they play uh, for clubs like Kilburn, Salisbury, Athelston, um, Goodwood, uh, Christie's Beach, Kenilworth. There's quite a few clubs now that have got it all going. Um, and from there, we pick a state team of 16 players that travel and play in the RFL Inclusive Academy. So they get to go onto the, oh, I suppose, onto a national platform and, and display their skills. Um, last year, we finished second by four points. And yes. That was up in Brisbane. And then the year before, we actually won the uh, Division One Grand Final. So it was the first time SA had won the final. So, um, yeah, there's some very talented, talented footballers within that that cohort, what they do is they essentially go away for a week at a time and they can play up to, I think it's in the vicinity of 10 games within a week. So it's it's a very demanding um, program they, they undertake, but they do it. They represent the state extremely well. I think also, though, the, the whole purpose of the leg in that is having people out there involved in sport, the intellectual, uh, you know, challenges and that. And it, it the it's also a bit unique that you may be standing your best mate a fair bit and all that, and yeah, I mean, I really enjoy the competition and the generally the camaraderie between between everyone there as well. Well, no, and that's exactly right. From a club perspective, we've hosted uh, for the past yep. four years with as a, as an Eagles, we've hosted the uh, the inclusive league for training sessions or games, their representative games, and that it's what those guys give back to our to our league players and that. I mean, on, on the weekend, people would have observed the fact that our guys do the guard of honour, but it's what they do inside the change rooms that people don't see is when they're getting around talking to them. Um, that's the sort of... We, we we actually take more out of it as a league club than what probably the inclusive blokes do because all our guys got in early to watch the game. Um, yeah, it's just... It is a rewarding program, but uh, there are some very talented individuals out there. Nathan Pepper from the Sample does an amazing job at running that league. Um, and, yeah... I think the sample should be proud of the the product they've got there. Yeah, and to Woodville West Torrance credit, I think you've probably um, enveloped and really jumped the board probably more than anyone else. With Jimmy Tumpus was very it was fantastic, and trying right. to think Jesse Lonigan, and the, you've had a fair a few people involved and go gone out and take training at various clubs, and so it's a fair bit of you guys really investing and in giving as well. Yeah, that was the that was the purpose of when we took when I took over the uh, the role as the, the senior coach of the the state team. It was to try and bring the standard of the state program up a level. So um, the assistant coaches are we've got um, Jesse Lonigan, who's an assistant coach. We've got Matt Knight, who's now out of Athelstan, he's an assistant coach from from Woodville West Torrens. We've got Annie Falkenberg, the female captain, who's an assistant coach. So it was about improving the standard of the program, where they were exposed to high performance testing as though what those young fellas go through and, and young girls go through in the combine, the inclusive league get to do that same exact testing, um, which then just gives them the exposure to a high performance environment. Yeah. And I think from us, that's, you know, when we, when we see how competitive they become in that testing environment, I think that's the reward for us. And because the wheelchair footy too, it conti- hopefully will grow to more sides, but yeah, it's developing probably the, the follow uh, number of people coming out watching gradually increasing. And yeah, the gradual hope, hopeful people about their hey, there's things out yeah, there. I think get that's involved aware, with awareness, disability. Yeah, awareness, awareness as well. is gradually increasing. Yep. It, it is, and it's, you're going up. And wheelchair footy has been amazing for our footy club to bring that team in. Um, has been been um, fantastic, but it is. It's one of those things. It is an awareness. You're going up a well established sports of, against um, basketball, wheelchair basketball, and things like that that have been around for many, many years. And we're starting this new concept, but I think the buy-in now from from the league clubs um, to see the league players, um, uh, men and women out there watching and participating in it now is, I, I really think it's starting to get some solid traction, and we're getting yeah. a lot more people registering for it. We, we've noticed this year as a club, we've got a lot of uh, recruits that want to come to the club now, so we're starting to see the transition from basketball into football, which is, you know, that's probably what the sports need. Yep. And look, hopefully the SNFL. Club stick around and it continues to maintain its integrity as the second bit as the second. I don't think second best is the correct word. It's the second most, uh, you know, big comp and recognised as such well, in the atten- country atten- too. Attendance, attendance yeah. wise and all that as well. That it, it's something we should be proud of, and I don't think it should be forgotten in that regard. Two da- two days. No, I, I agree. I agree. The thing um, you just mentioned there, the attendance. Like we've had our our first three home games, obviously we 
we've played have been the highest attended games we've had for many years. So I think the sample should be really proud and, and Darren Chandler and the team of what they've been able to do. Like round one for us on Good Friday, over 3,000 people down at um, uh, Mornington Kia Oval. That's a that's a high attendance rate for us on a public holiday yep. um, on a long weekend. So what we're seeing is and we are seeing the crowd come back now. Um, and I think that's a real credit to the standard of footy that's being played. Um, but also, you know, the promotion of the game, we are seeing a lot of promotion about the sample. Um, so I think, yeah, it is one of those things that we should never underestimate the product we've got. It's a fantastic product and uh, it's loved by a lot of South Australians. Yep, very much so. Hey, David, good luck. Good luck uh, continuing the, with the success of Woodville West Torrens at the moment. Obviously not quite so much luck against the Red and Blue Mob, but yeah. Um, <laughs> nah, we but, look, look forward to catching up again the next couple of weeks, Dave. Beautiful. Thanks very much for your time, fellas. And Thank we you. might touch base with you as the season goes on, if that's all right as well. No, I look forward to it. Thank you very much, mate. And thanks to David there for his time. Uh, absolutely fantastic. And um, obviously what's going on down at Woodville West Torrens there at the moment, they'd be pretty happy. And just SNFL-wise and yep. footy-wise in general. And David carries many hats and he's a person I've got a lot of time for. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Dave. Absolutely. All right, we'll move on to this week's games. We've got Glenorgan Sturt in the grand final rematch down at uh, Stratorama Oval. Yeah, I'll go the Bays. I'm going to go the Bays as well. Uh, West Adelaide v. the Panthers. I'll go West Adelaide. The Bulldogs v. the Eagles. This becomes yeah, a really game, good game. Big game. Um, if in doubt, go the home side, so I'll go the Ponderosa. It is at the Ponderosa, and I will go the Eagles, just. Yep. Uh, North Adelaide v Adelaide. Uh, I'll go North Adelaide. Depending on what Adelaide select with their younger guys, I'm going to go North Adelaide as yeah, well. Yeah, they'll take a few down, remember, and all that. That's so. correct. And just to finish us off, could this be the last time that Port Adelaide and Nord play in the SNFL at Alberton, being that it's on Saturday night as well? Maybe. I still think it's a bit more complicated than that. I still think Port will still be in the SNFL next year. So. Yep. Yeah. We'll watch to see yeah, how that one goes. Space. But uh, who are you picking, mate? Nord or Port now again? Do we secretly tip against Nord no, again? I'll go, I'll go Nord. No, I'll go Nord as well. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Now, just one thing to finish off on the SNFL. Do we see a merger between the Bloods and the Panthers anywhere in the future? Because they're probably the two most logical clubs that would probably benefit from a merger. I Again, question without notice. Yeah, but again, you've got to remember that the likelihood of Port and Adelaide leaving, event, are leaving so you're down to eight sides then, you don't want to go any less. Mm-hmm. So I would hope not. I'm just I thinking say, from a financially viable oh, look, point of view. Both those clubs are in... Yep. Um... Need a better outcome than currently. Leave yep. it at that. Hence the reason why I yep. put it on the agenda. Uh, question without notice, potentially there. Look, and the more important thing, look, our hearts out. Yes. And best wishes to Sam May. Um, look, can't really miss anything more than that. All the best. Yep, absolutely. Hence the reason why we haven't yeah. really brought it up no, too much no, because that's, it's uh, that's giving that's some enough. privacy to the yep. to the family. Yep, that's enough. Which uh, which they've asked for, and it, yeah, just a terrible situation, unfortunately. Uh, the latter after round three, Woodville West Torrens and Centrals and Nord all undefeated with three wins apiece. Glenelg sitting fourth and Sturt sitting fifth. All right, let's move on to the SNFLW very very quickly. Wins to Glenelg, South Adelaide, West Adelaide, and Sturt in the SNFLW, mate. Yeah. Um Probably Glenelg there, reasonably impressive. I think South Adelaide have now got the mojo and South are looking they're like they're probably probably the team to beat. Mm-hmm. Nord a little bit disappointing against the Bloods. Yep. Um, yeah. And, I, and and West Adelaide have improved in that area yeah. this year too. So. And the development final is this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, South Adelaide and Glenelg playing the development league grand final. And that probably um, gives you a bit of a look at where those clubs are at yeah, when it comes to a little bit more depth. depth. All right, let's move on to this week's league matches, which is uh, Glenelg v Sturt. I'll go Glenelg. Uh, Nord v the Panthers. I'll go the Panthers. I'll go the Panthers there as well. I'll go Glenelg in the first one. North Adelaide v West Adelaide. I'll go West Adelaide. I'll go West Adelaide as well. And the Eagles v Centrals. 
I'll go Centrals. Centrals it is. The ladder after round six is Glenelg and South Adelaide sitting top and second. Central sitting third and Norwood sitting fourth. All right, mate, very quickly on the cricket. Uh, will Rashid Khan play for the strikers in the BBL after Australia po- postponed its tour of Afghanistan? Yeah, I think they're two different matters. Uh my understanding is he loves playing here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd be, I think they're two different matters. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, men's state squads, ins and outs. Anyone from South Australia that we're looking to secure? We did talk briefly about it, but is there any more to come that not, you can think of? Not sure. Not sure. Um, I'm not sure, I, I admit. I will check where Jack Weatherall comes back into the equation. I haven't spoken to Weathers about it. Yep. Um, I might give him a call this week, though. Yep. Yep. Might be something to follow up on for next yep. week there. And uh, Harris starring for Leicestershire and will be hard to ignore with the form that he's in at the moment for the Australian team. Obviously, there's a big gap between tests, but yeah. he seems to be scoring some pretty good runs over in England at the moment. Yeah, he's, he's probably getting himself back in the equation well and truly for the next Ashes tour. So, yeah. yeah. All right, mate. We're going to take a very, very quick break. When we come back, uh, local legend and golf um, extraordinaire, Craig Martin, coming right up. Yep. Liking this podcast? Please like, rate, and subscribe. I'm Stephen Rowe, and you're listening to the Game On podcast. Local legends. And joining us on the line is Craig Martin, uh, talking all things golf with Adelaide being the centrepiece of the Live Tour this weekend. Thanks for joining us again, mate. No worries. Thanks for your time. So where's your highlights and what are you looking forward to this weekend, mate? Yeah, well, unlike last year, I was out there every day. This year, I, I haven't had an opportunity yet. So looking forward to getting out there on Friday and watching. Um, by all reports and from what I've Still keeping a close eye on things. Um, been reading and seeing lots of uh, uh, social media and whatnot. Uh, the course looks in immaculate condition, which um, last year was fairly rushed. Preparing the course, they've obviously had 12 months to prepare with the live guys, injecting a lot of money into the uh, maintenance of the course. So I'd expect the golf course will be uh, in fantastic condition and probably a tougher test than it was for the players last year. But... Um, Ticket sales, are uh, they've increased capacity. So last year, I think they were averaging low 20s, um, 20,000. But there's obviously being such a big property, there's room for uh, uh, more general admission. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're expecting up to 30,000 people daily. Um, I think Saturday's a sellout, but there are still tickets available for Friday and Sunday from what I've read and heard on the radio this afternoon. So, yeah, no, the anticipation, I mean, live the... Last year, no one really knew what to expect. They'd, you know, to go and see it live, they'd seen it on TV and whatnot, but the the whole concept, different to the traditional golf tournaments that we've discussed in the past. But, um, yeah, I mean, the expectations were just blown out of the water in terms of the crowd and the golf. I mean, the golf was crazy in terms of the scoring last year. Like Taylor Gooch, 20 under after two rounds. Mm-hmm. No one could have predicted Thought that. Thought it was even. you playing, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 20 over, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no one could have predicted those scores. Um, even during the practice rounds, I was kind of predicting the guys would maybe shoot six, seven under. Yep. But uh, he went out there and shot back-to-back 10 under rounds, which was unbelievable, and then held on to win on the final day. So it'll be interesting. I mean, last year's weather was just amazing. Had no wind for three days and and quite warm conditions with forecast for the next few days. A little bit cooler and hopefully a bit of breeze. So that'll that's the golf course's defence yep, yep. is obviously the, the weather um, and also the way they set up the golf course. So you'd anticipate they still want good scoring, but I, I would expect maybe about 15 under to 18 under will win over the three days, but um, subject to weather and... Um, and uh, obviously, uh, yeah, the way they set up the golf course, but the way Liv is set up is really to entertain those watching on TV and around the world. And uh, obviously, the, 
the masses that are there, which, um, you know, Australia and Adelaide has really set the benchmark for live golf well, that's what in, ask, internationally. That's what I was going to ask you. Uh, you know, how can Adelaide improve on what they did last year, considering it seems to be the, the talking point of the golfing circuit at the moment? moment. Oh, I suppose like any any event, there's there's probably those those that were organising and whatnot. Um, they will improve this year. I mean, there are a few issues around congestion around the golf course and things like that. So, how how crowds move around the course would be one improvement. Probably, I would expect you'd probably find the the uh, spectator ropes aren't as close to the fairway as they were last year. It was it was kind of crazy. I've never seen. You know, basically, you're almost standing on the fairway. So yep. uh, I'd expect those type of things. And, <clears throat> I mean, the, the corporate hospitality was obviously um, a, a big component last year, and that's fully booked out. So that's a good thing because it's attracting a lot of people from interstate and overseas to and Adelaide. party um, holes still going? That's what I was going to ask you. How's that set up this year? Could we see more hole-in-ones this year? I mean, that's, that's a pretty tough hole, to be honest. I mean, they you generally, it's playing. I mean, I know the last year, the last day they played it shorter, so the guys are probably only hitting eight or nine on in there. But it's such a narrow green, and it generally plays into the southwesterly breeze, so it's not an easy hole. Um, I noticed today in the pro am, they, the, even the amateurs were hitting from right at the back, which is about 155 metre shot. So hitting, you know, seven iron, six iron, depending on how far you hit it, of course. But uh, for the pros, they're still sitting. They'd be hitting seven, eight irons from back there. Um, so it's not an easy hole. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, they're, like I said, I mean, that went around the world, obviously, that hole in one and the the mayhem that happened afterwards with the beer cans. And I think I said last year when that all happened, that won't happen again. And there's plastic cups this year around that hole. So <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it's probably a good um, idea. Well, yeah. unfortunately, a couple of people got hit. Um, officials and, and marshals got hit by cans, which is not good. So, um, yeah, there's obviously that's one improvement for this year would be all the plastic cups around that hole. Yeah. But obviously the party atmosphere and <clears throat> with the concerts afterwards as well, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a brilliant event. So, And now is Neemanum the, the man to beat this year, do you think? Uh, I mean, if, think if, you look at the, if you look at the quality of the players compared to last year, Really, last year there was what forty-eight players, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you know, really from maybe from thirty-five to forty-eight, the depth wasn't there. The way that they've um, recruited, and also they had the, uh, um, I guess, the Asian tour um, with the guys coming in who earned their right to be on the tour. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, obviously, John Rahm's team came in, so there's an additional team, and then there's a couple of wild cards with Anthony Kim. It's fantastic that he's back, having not been on the Pro Tour for 10 years. Um, he's had his personal issues, and I heard him interviewed by Timmy G tonight, and very good interview. Um, you know, he's overcome his own personal issues and never thought he'd come back to golf. Um, golf's such a hard sport to <laughs> click. So it's great that he's back, and, I mean, he shot 65 in Hong Kong. So, um, you know, good, good to see him play yeah. well. Um, really, it's such an open field i mean cam smith naturally you'd, you'd expect would be up there um but you could probably you could throw a name throw a dart at a dartboard of 20 names and probably be a good chance um uh, grange kind of will su- suit a longer hitter uh, is, is that where shambo would actually benefit yeah i mean really the key to grange is yeah driving and certainly um, with no wind, the par fives for these guys are fairly fairly short uh, or certainly reachable, all of them. Um, but if the wind gets up, some of them play into the wind, makes it a bit tougher. But um, certainly someone who hits it long and is a good putter, so uh, I'd be tipping um, someone like a, yeah, DeChambeau, Brooks Koepka, um, you know, from an Aussie point of view, Lucas Herbert. I think the golf course would suit him. Um he would be my pick for best Aussie, um, but yeah, I, th- I think really there's so many good players in that in that field, um, and that's the beauty of live. Despite what the PGA Tour lovers will suggest, is the live tour. You know, you've got now a collection of twenty to thirty of the best players in the world um, who are who are there, and I mean, 
yeah, okay, the top five players at the recent US Masters were PGA players, but you know, four four of the top twelve were live players. So they they're competitive. They're playing a reduced schedule to the guys on the PGA tour, but you know, they are some of the best and deserve to be playing the ma- all majors. Um, so it's I mean, golf is still going through that yeah. turmoil. Well, that was yeah. what I was going to ask. Is that uh, we have talked about it previously uh, when we've had you on the show as to where it's at. Where where is it at currently now as we speak? Yeah, we. I would have thought actually, because we haven't spoken for a few months, I would have thought that there'd be some more resolution to it. But it, it kind of, it's kind of stalled. Um, there were talks that the yeah, PJ, yeah. P, PJ Tour and Live guys met up in the Bahamas a few weeks ago, I believe. Um, but if you look at it, um, PJ Tour really, uh, I think they they can see the writings on the wall, but they're really, um, I suppose, not. Not 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 um, conceding as much as you probably thought they would, mm-hmm. um, and really, oh yeah, I mean you just hear Greg Norman this afternoon in his press conference say, you know, we we're doing what we're doing, um, and they can do whatever they like, um, you know, for the betterment of the the betterment of the sport long term. They the two the two sides have to come together, um, whether it's um, just for the majors. Or if it's just for the for the big events like the players and and other events mm-hmm. on the PGA Tour, but I mean, really, if if you look at the PGA Tour currently, um, Scotty Scheffler is just dominating. Um, full credit to him; like he he would probably dominate if he's playing here this week in Adelaide too. Yep. Um, so it's not a case he's beating Neville Nobodies. He's you know still beating quality fields. Because any anyone who's playing on the PGA Tour still is you know very very good golfer um but yeah i think i don't know it's it's just a real weird one um you know there's all the rumors have been going around about rory mcelroy joining live and that's all been proven to be bs yep um he he resigned from the pga tour players uh, advisement board um about five four five months ago because he was left out to dry and became Really, PJ Tour's scapegoat. Um, but interesting, in the last 24 hours, he's, it's rumoured that he's going to join that board again. So um, it's still interesting times with golf. Um, the next two years, I mean, for the betterment of the sport, I mean, the last thing you want is guys winning British Opens with reduced fields and, you know, players like, you know, Brooks Kepka and and though oh, Brooks is probably a bad example because he's he's exempt with his PGA win, but maybe you know guys guys such as Sergio Garcia and um, oh, even John Rahm really now um, joining Live, he should be playing in every event possible, but obviously uh, can't go back to the PGA Tour now that he's joined Live, so it's, it's just a real real messy scenario. Um, what it looks like in the future is anyone's guess. You hear all the players on both sides; they don't, they don't know what's going on. And um, yeah, the powers to be. Eventually, we'll have to sort it out. All right, mate. We'll get you out here, get you out of here on this one. Your top three for this weekend at the Live Golf here in Adelaide. Who do you think? Uh, my top three. Yeah, um, like I said I, I really like Lucas Herbert. Um, I think he'll be up there. Um, yeah, go for Brooks Kepka and maybe um, one out of the left field, maybe Louis Oosthausen. So we'll keep an eye on that one for sure. All, all good. Thank you very much for joining us again, mate, and giving us uh, your tips for this weekend, but also talking golf in general. And as per usual, we'll uh, we'll touch base with you uh, around some of the big golf events. Greatly yeah, appreciated, mate. Craig. No worries, guys. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Bye bye. We thank Craig for his time there tonight, talking all things golf, and in particular the Live Golf being back here. He loves his golf, he Craig. Does, He's absolutely. a good man. Thank you for joining us once again. All right, mate, let's get into Happy, da- happy Days. Happy Days.
All right, happy birthday this week to Isaac Rankin, drafted to the Gold Coast Suns with pick number three of the 2018 draft. As a child, Rankin played an array of sports, including basketball, rugby, tennis, and eventually chose to focus on AFL or Aussie Rules football. He grew up playing junior football for the Edwardstown and Flinders Park Football Clubs before being given the opportunity to rise through the junior ranks of SNFL Club West Adelaide. 2016, his first senior SNFL game for West Adelaide at the age of 16, kicked two goals on debut. That's not a bad way to start at 16, is it? He showed a bit. To admit, there was a game against Nord at Richmond where he caused the ball to reverse twice in the last five minutes where Nord won by a point. We, uh, we might have been thanking him after that game. So <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, he was later selected to represent South Australia in the 2017 and 2018 underage carnival or championships where he was named All-Australian both years and played a critical role yeah, in South Australia's kicked, 2018 I championship. He kicked, I, I think he right. kicked five, yeah. He certainly dominated. Absolutely. Rankin made his debut against the Melbourne Melbourne Football Club in Round 6 2020 and impressed with a three-goal performance which earned him the Round 6 Rising Star nomination. Obviously then being traded back to or requesting a trade back to Adelaide and the rest has been history. Now moving into the midfield, what what can we expect uh, moving forward? I, I'd like to see him in there a little bit more. Yeah, well. I want to see a bit of consistency too. Like played very well against Carlton and then didn't do much last Saturday night. Uh, against Eston, and so there's a bit of a. I want to see a bit more from him in that regard. Teams would have put a little bit more time and effort into yeah. him, knowing that he's probably going to be in there. So, very, very interesting. All right, let's move on to cricket. 2013 West Indian West Indian cricketer Chris Gale smashes the fastest century in history in just 30 balls. Yeah, he, when he goes, <laughs> geez, he does go. Yeah. Well. There's plenty of cars out in the car park that have probably got a few windows that yeah. might have been smashed along the way there as well. A few lines to female reporters as well. Exactly yeah. right. So. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, basketball, 1989, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scores 10 points in his last game as a Laker in the 121-117 to 117 win over Seattle Supersonics at the LA Forum. He, he did okay. We've had some legends. Yeah, We've we had have. Michael you, Jordan, you Magic yeah, Johnson. Yep. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is definitely yep. up there as well. All right, we move on to tennis, mate. Bjorn Borg loses 6-2, 6-3 to Jordi Aris after an eight-year layoff without practicing or playing in any exhibition matches. It showed that if he, if, it showed that if he still, he would have been more than competitive still. Obviously. Agreed. Agreed. Well, that's, he didn't lose love and love. He lost nine. two and three. Yeah. And obviously Without in the second set. Exactly yeah. right. Very, very interesting there. And to finish us off, mate, in 2023, the MLB uh, Boston Red Sox outfielder Matasha Yokohida hits a solo home run and a grand slam in the eighth innings, 12-5 win over the Brewers in Milwaukee. He had a fair game, didn't he? Yeah, you take that. Well, grand slams are yeah. hard to come by, and yeah. you know you're hitting a solo home run, and uh, and then backing up uh, is absolutely amazing. All right, mate, let's scoot into the extra time. Big finish. Extra time. Big finish. All right, we we'll kick off with tennis. Alex Diminor is the first Australian to beat Rafa on the clay, but then out in the next round. Yeah. Encouraging, but then I would have liked to him to have gone a couple more rounds. But yeah, I think it was yeah. a, a huge effort, and obviously a um, what can I say? An emotional playing. You know, one of the greats of the game, and and beating him. You know, getting yourself up yeah. for that game. The letdown is obviously the one after, and that's exactly where it is. South Australian Tanasi Kakanaka dropped just eighteen games to storm through to, through the qualifying in Madrid against Dominic Team. Yeah, encouraging there, and yeah, you know, you'd love a few other, a couple other Australians have played qualifying to be as fair income as that. Over Absolutely, the years. Uh, yes. you know he has had some injuries, so understandable as well. That win and also his ranking at the moment has now propelled him into direct qualification to the French Open, and there are nine Australians that will dire- yeah. d- direct entry into the Roland Garros tournament. Eight male and one female into the main draw, kicking off on May 26, which we'll cover as yep. it gets a little bit closer. Yep. All right, NBA. We did say we we're going to talk a little bit more about the NBA last week. We had wins to the playoff play in tournament teams uh, in the West and the East conferences, which has now got us through to the main 
uh, draw or round one of the playoffs. We've got the Thunder and the Pelicans. The Thunder le- leading their one nil. The Clippers, the Mavericks tied at one all. The Timberwolves and the Suns with the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves leading two zero. The Nuggets and the Lakers, uh, the Nuggets leading 2-0 there in the West. Out in the East, the Celtics leading the Heat 1-0. Uh, what do we got? Cleveland leading the Magic 2-0. Series tied between the Bucks and the Pacers at one all, And the New York Knicks leading the Philadelphia 76ers 2-0. So some games there obviously being played at the moment. Uh, we'll Again, keep abreast of that as we go along. All right, let's move on to the soccer. Round 25 had to be rescheduled for the Adelaide United team. Uh, They will now be playing on Wednesday, the 1st of May, against the Gold Coast Mariners in Queensland because of some adverse weather causing delay out of Dubai. Yes, um, interesting in terms of... yeah, there's always a few things contribute, aren't there, in the end? Yeah. Well, obviously playing games here, there and everywhere and a freak storm going through Dubai there uh, sort of slowed everybody down a little bit. Adelaide United, Giuseppe Bo- Bovalina has signed for MLS side Vancouver Whitecaps um, for an undisclosed fee. This is good that Adelaide is, the youngsters are getting noticed on the world stage. I think they go okay as a business Adelaide in that regard too. Um, and... Remembering that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's buy cheap, sell more, etc. To try and therefore balance your business that way. It's a very interesting concept, so, isn't it? When yeah. you think about it, yeah. uh, Adelaide with three wins out of their last five games, but they still sit ninth. Yep. Yep. All right. So let's finish off on a couple of. Uh, I'll open the floor, mate. The good, the bad, the ugly for this week. Oh, I think you've got to go the bad, the Adelaide Essendon game in general. Yes. Yes, the umpiring, but. Josh Rochelle, and just in general, that's my bad, probably bad, it does qualify for bad and ugly, I think. Yep. Good. Oh. Live golf being back here yeah, in Adelaide, mate. Yeah, back in Adelaide. Yep. 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 And uh, for me, the the good is definitely the uh, the live golf being back in Adelaide. The bad at the moment is probably the, the state of football with um, suspensions and umpiring yeah. decisions, and there's a lot of stuff up in the air, and there's a lot of moving parts, and unfortunately... Uh, we're not getting the quality of umpiring that we have had in the past, and with all of this scrutiny, it means that we could potentially lose a few along the way as well, which wouldn't be good. All right, mate, it's been a huge episode once again. We thank Dave Kuzner, we thank Craig Martin, and uh, as per usual, mate, we promise to do better next time. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. In this crazy world we live in, we all need the distraction. Enjoying the show? Like, rate, and subscribe. Hook up and connect with us on social media at Sportscast SA. We'll see you next time on Game On.